turn your videos off. Okay. All right, welcome everybody. Thank you all for being here for our second webinar as we continue to celebrate uh, Native Plant Month in Arkansas. Uh, we are in the middle of our virtual spring meeting hosted by the Arkansas Native Plant Society. This webinar is being recorded. Afterwards, the recording will be uploaded to our YouTube channel. I also want to encourage you to check out our online silent auction website at biddingowl.com slash AMPS. That's B-I-D-D-I-N-G owl.com slash ANPS. Uh, you will need to create an account as a bidder on that website in order to bid on our items, but you'll have a chance to win everything, anything from botany books to Native Plant Society merchandise, native plants, as well as signed copies of the recently published Tree Shrubs and Woody Vines of Arkansas. Uh, this month, we're also having our uh, Native Plant Adventure Challenge, where you can help raise money for the Native Plant Society by gathering sponsors, who will agree to donate to AMPS for each native plant species that you can identify throughout the month. Uh, for more information on that, uh, you can email me at amps.president at gmail.com and I will send you a link uh, to where uh, you will have registered on a website that you can then forward on to your potential sponsors. Uh, I also want to encourage you to join the Arkansas Native Plant Society. You can do so by going to our website, uh, anps.org slash join, and you can join online uh, that way. Uh, I want to give a quick plug for the next two webinars we have coming up that will be uh, this upcoming next week uh, in the middle of the week, Wednesday, May 12th at 2 o'clock. Uh, Bo Brown, author of the recently published uh, foraging the Ozark is going to give us a talk on invasive plants that are uh, edible. Uh, his title is, uh, his talk is going to be Here Come the Invasive Wars, Foraging Invasive Species to Help Our Natives. Uh, also on Thursday, May 13th at one o'clock, Jay Justice, uh, a mycology expert here in Arkansas, is going to give a talk on uh, uh, the relationship between fun, uh, fungi and native plants. His talk is Who's on Top? An overview of the known associations between plants and fungi. Our speaker today is Karen Willard. Uh, Karen is a contract botanist who has worked for various uh, state agencies, uh, nonprofit organizations, and environmental consulting firms. She holds a master's degree in natural resources from The Ohio State University. Uh, her main research interests include wetland ecology and plant and insect interactions. Uh, today, Karen will give a presentation on mosses, the original tree huggers. And so with that, I'm going to hand it over to Karen. Uh, thank you very much. All right, thank you. Um, well, welcome. I want to thank you all for coming. I'm excited that there's so many people interested in mosses. And I want to thank the Arkansas Native Plant Society and Eric for inviting me to give a talk to you today. So first off, I just want to start with a sort of a simple definition of moss, what mosses are, and it's sort of obvious. Okay, so they are small land plants lacking what we call true vascular tissue. Okay, so let me uh, delve into this a little more. So moss are really tiny, as we all know, probably, typically uh, just two inches or less. The currently extant species that is the world record for being the largest comes in at a whopping 20 inches. And this is a species in the genus Dawsonia, and it's found all the way across the other side of the world in Australia, New Zealand, and New Guinea. Um, but the size can be somewhat intimidating for people who kind of want to learn about how to identify these species. In some cases, you do need either a hand lens or in some cases, a compound microscope just to even figure out what species you're looking at. So that can be somewhat intimidating, but I do want to say, you know, we can still appreciate how beautiful the mosses are. We can have them in gardens. And there are a lot of species we can identify even without all that extra close examination. So they are some of the first land plants to colonize the planet. So they belong to what we call a informal group called bryophytes. 
And that includes species like hornworts, liverworts, and the mosses. And they showed up uh, on land between around 500 and 400 million years ago. And the time frame is sort of uh, broad because the actual fossil record for these type of plants is really um, scarce. They don't preserve well and they're really small. So it's really hard to um, investigate their and, and actually find these fossils. Um, you can compare this to uh, what's the most dominant plant species we find on our planet now, the flowering plants. They didn't show up far, far later, about 140 million years ago. So they're relatively babies compared to mosses. And we usually think of mosses as primitive, but they have been around for a long, long time. So they must be doing something right, right? Okay. So in order for mosses to survive on land and they evolved from an ancient ocean dwelling species of green algae. And so for them to come and survive on the land, they had to overcome a lot of um, uh, harsh conditions, right? So uh, drying out was a big factor. So you're no longer surrounded by water, you're in an atmosphere which is, is pretty much taking all the moisture away from the plant. And so some of the features that these mosses evolved to overcome this are one, uh, the protection of an embryo in a chamber. And that chamber is called, for mosses is called the archegonium. And so this kept the, the embryo safe and it kept it moist in those conditions. And they also have what's known as stomata. So you might have heard about this in um, regular flowering plants. So these are just pores that the plants have. They have uh, guard cells surrounding those pores that can open and close. So when they want to preserve their water inside the cells, they'll close those to keep the water from um, evaporating as water vapor. And when they want to release water, they can have them open. The mosses do have these. They do not have them on their leafy parts, but they do have them on their structures known as the sporophytes. And I'll talk about those a little bit more later on. And these mosses also do still have some features that are found in green algae. Okay, so some of the, what you might call relic characteristics of the plant. And one of these is biflagellate sperm. So the male reproductive cells have two little tail-like structures and they actually require some sort of film of water in order to swim and reach that female egg to fertilize it. And so finally, the last part of my definition that these moss are lacking what we call true vascular tissue. So in here, I have an image of a cross section of a stem from a flowering plant. And you'll see these big, large, empty cells. And these are what comprise these big vascular tubes called the xylem. And those transport nutrients and water uh, up through from the bottom of the plant, from the soil, up throughout the rest of the plant. And they also have what's known as phloem. Those are the transport vessels for the food that's produced by the plant. Now, when we talk about true vascular system, uh, one of the key components that these have, which mosses don't, is this complex molecule called lignin. So this surrounds those xylem cells, those big empty cells, and it gives them additional structural support so that the plants are not going to collapse in on themselves under any pressure. And this allows those other vascular plants to grow really large, uh, and they're not constrained like, by their size like they are in mosses. 
Now, at one point, people were told that mosses were non-vascular plants, that they didn't have any sort of vascular system. But we now know at least some of the larger mosses do in fact have some sort of maybe somewhat primitive vascular system. So we have in here again, another cross section of the stem and this time it's the moss plant. And you see these much smaller cells compared to the xylem. And these are the hydroids. So they function in the same way, carrying food and nutrients up to the throughout the plant. And they also have uh, what are called leptoid cells. And these compromise the transport vessels that carry food that's produced in the leaves um, throughout the rest of the cell, or sorry, plant. And mosses are really special and unique in that they have a leaves that are typically just one cell layer thick. Okay, so here is a cross section image of the leaf of a moss cell plant. And all of these are just one individual cell. These leaves are highly absorbent. So they can take in moisture and other chemicals and compounds directly from the atmosphere and incorporate them into the plant. The moss, unlike a lot of other land plants, do not have this sort of waxy cuticle or coating over their leaves. So that in other land plants like flowering plants that really helps protect them from drying out. And so mosses do dry out fairly easy and biologists like to find, make up fancy words and terms for everything. So in this case, the fact that they dry out really easy is known as Poikilohydry. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Poikilohydry. And so when the conditions are very dry, you'll see the mosses are all shriveled and twisted. They look like they're almost dead. But all it takes is uh, and some rain, additional moisture in the atmosphere for them to pop back up again and look completely fine. And this is all similar to um, the resurrection fern, if you're familiar with that. Again, it dries up when it, it shrivels up and gets all dry and dead looking when it's dry out. But once the moisture returns into its system, it can pop back up again and, and be completely fine. So mosses are really cool and that they can live pretty much in any ecosystem. Okay, so they are found everywhere except for oceans and really big lakes. And they can live on really in really harsh conditions, unlike a lot of flowering plants, right? So they don't require a thick layer of soil in order to survive. Right? So you can find them growing on rocks, on the tree trunks, uh, in cracks on the sidewalk, and in some of the harsher conditions, like in the Arctic tundra, um, these are the main dominant plant species that you find there, along with things like lichen. And then it might be kind of cut off for you guys, but here is another somewhat harsh ecosystem. This is a peat bog, right? so very acidic, very wet, and again, moss, is the dominant plant species that occurs there. And I will tell you, I could talk, I could give you a talk for like two hours just on bogs and the peat moss that live there, but I will spare you that. Um, but I will say they are very interesting. And these systems that you find up in Canada, in, in, in Russia, in Northern parts of the United States um, are really interesting ecosystems that are dominated by mosses. So now just going into the parts of the moss, 
the moss is composed of two different main parts and they represent different stages of the life cycle of the plant. And these two life cycles occur in all plants, um, but they are very unique in, in mosses compared to others. And so I'll talk about that. So the dominant stage of mosses, which you would probably recognize as the moss, that green leafy plant is what's called the gametophyte. And so that's composed of this stem, these leaf-like structures, and these fine root-like structures known as rhizoids or rhizoids. So the rhizoids do not function like roots in that they don't absorb moisture and transfer it up to the plant. Um, they're essentially there just to anchor the plant to whatever substrate it's growing on. And the second structure of the plant is known as the sporophyte. And so it has this long stalk known as the seta. On top of the stalk is a capsule, and that's where it produces the spores. These spores are similar to seeds and other plants, but they do not, they are very lightweight. They don't have this extra nutrients or food reserve for this for the plant. Um, and so they are, because they're very lightweight, they can travel really far in the atmosphere and they don't require um, any sort of plant seed carriers like you'd find in other species. Okay, so just a little bit more about, like I said, the gametophyte is that green leafy structure. And usually you'll find a lot of them, even multiple species growing together in big clumps, but really each one of these is its own individual plant. This is the dominant and more persistent stage. So this is what you find um, growing throughout the year in the plant. And let's compare that with flowering plants. So in flowering plants, the gametophyte stage, that structure is really highly reduced. So most people don't even see it. And all it is is just a few cells that are found either in the pollen grain of the plant or in the ovules, the egg cells of the plant um, in flowering plants. So the gametophyte is highly reduced in some of these higher plants, but in mosses, that is the main structure that you'll, that you'll see. And usually um, in most species, you'll have individual plants that are either male gametophytes or female. So they'll either have the male reproductive structure that's known as the anthridia, and that produces the sperm, or other plants living closely right next to it that are female, and they contain that archegonium, and that's that chamber that's gonna be protecting the fertilized egg um, as it develops. And as that develops, as the fertilized egg develops, it will become, it will develop and grow into the sporophyte. So in this time of year, you will see plant structures that look like this. So there's these funky little segments on the tops of the gametophyte, and those are the male anthridia. And sometimes they're referred to as splash cups. Okay, so it kind of has these big leaf like structures around the reproductive organ to help catch water. Because, as I mentioned before, those sperm uh, essentially require water, at least a film of water, in order to swim and find the closest female plant um, that's nearby. So then the sporophyte is the second structure and here they are represented. These structures produce the spores, which when they are released will develop into the next generation of the gametophyte. These are an ephemeral part of the plant. So you'll only see them at certain times of the year. Uh, a lot of them are found in fall or winter, I find most of the time. 
They are completely dependent on that gametophyte for structural support and for food. Right? So photosynthesis occurs in the gametophyte in these leafy areas, but it does not occur in the sporophyte. And comparing this to all of the other plants you see, like the conifers and flowering plants, um, the sporophyte in those plants is the dominant structure, right? So when you see a tree and its leaves, that is the sporophyte. And these sporophytes are really, in some cases, critical to identifying the, the moss species. So if you are taking pictures of mosses and you're asking people to identify them for you, having that um, sporophyte can really be a helpful key to understanding what species you have. So now I wanna talk a little bit about this kind of cool spore distribution mechanisms that the mosses have. Okay, so, at the top of the capsule, in a lot of species, you'll find these ring of tooth-like structures. And they're really tiny, so you kind of need a microscope or a hand lens to see them. Um, but these is, this is called the peristome. So the peristome is sort of like a, the, a release valve that keeps the capsule closed. But when conditions are right, when the, when the spores are fully developed and when the atmosphere is somewhat dry, those little teeth sort of start to peel back and unfold and allow the spores to be released. And a lot of, a lot of moss species have that, some don't. The shape, the way they look can also be a good indication of what species you have. And then you have, in some cases, these exploding capsules. So now we don't have the teeth acting as a, a valve to release them. Um, so what occurs here, and this is really common in the peat moss. So you have this round capsule and over time, the pressure internally builds and builds and builds. And once those spores are mature, the capsule it literally just explodes and collapses in on itself, pops off this little top. And here you see what it looks like after it's exploded and released all those spores out into the atmosphere. And I have worked in um, bogs that are dominated by these peat mosses, which you see here. Uh, and so certain times of the year, usually around mid to late August, you can actually hear like the pop pop popping sound of all these little exploding capsules. And it's pretty crazy to see it here, like these tiny little plants making all these fairly loud noise because there's so many of them in one area. So it's kind of neat. So the mosses can be categorized into a couple of different growth forms that helps to sort of separate them out a little bit, making things a little easier to understand. So the first growth form I want to share with you is the carpet moss. Also, the fancy term for that is chlorocarpus. In this growth form, you have these multi-branched stems, or so lots of branches coming off the main stem. The stem is what's called prostrate or just sort of flopped over, laying on the ground, kind of a lazy, lazy looking stem. And then you'll usually have, I don't have the image here, but you'll usually have a bunch of sporophytes sort of growing off along the lateral branches. And so one example of that here is the fern moss. So it kind of looks somewhat like a fern or maybe a feathery feather um, because of all that branching. Another growth form are the cushion moss or acrocarpus growth form. So here you'll have just this one main stem, no branching. There's just all these leaves coming off. They kind of look like branches, but these are just really big leaves in this case. 
The stems are sticking straight up, so they're erect. And then you'll have just a single sporophyte coming up off the female plants here. So one good example that's a really common around here are the hair cap moss. And that is the cushion moss or acrocarpus growth form. And then another one that's sort of like a hybrid between the two. Um, some don't really consider it its own unique growth form, but I just wanted to mention it here. And that's sort of this tree-like form. So here you'll have branching. It's usually closer to the top or the apex of the stem. The, the stems are erect in this case. And you'll have usually multiple sporophytes growing up at the apex of the plant. And you'll see this in the aptly named tree moss. So here's an example of the American tree moss, which um, I haven't seen around here where I live. I know I've seen it up in Newton County and it might be in other places um, and definitely up further in Northern part of the United States. So um, the next few slides, I just want to share with you what I think is, is probably the most interesting part of mosses, and that's their ecological functions. So what sort of services do they provide for the natural world in general? And one of those uh, in certain conditions is soil stabilization and formation, right? So these mosses, because they can occur just right on rock material. They don't need any layer of soil to survive. They can cling right to that and they can take in nutrients right from the atmosphere. Um, so they can be what we call some of the first players of primary succession. So primary succession is just, for example, you have a volcano, it completely wipes out everything that's there that is living. And so when plants come back to recolonize, the first thing you'll have there would be mosses and lichens. And then those moss help to form soil in multiple ways. First, they'll be trapping particles at the site. They'll also be releasing organic acids that help to break down that parent rock material into soils. And then they'll also contribute organic material by just like dying and, and adding to that organic material, which is an important part or component of soil. They can also provide habitat, nesting material, and food for other organisms. Okay, so a lot of smaller insects or arthropods uh, find shelter and safety within the moss plants. And I put up this Eastern Phoebe nest specifically because I had the great experience of having a little nest uh, right next to my house last year. And what I noticed was that the nest itself on the interior is basically composed of a sort of clay-like mud. And then surrounding the outside of that is lots and lots of, of moss. Uh, and my hypothesis there is that they're using that as sort of a way to sort of regulate the moisture of the moss. So I didn't really find moss, as you would think, maybe in the cup, creating like a cushion for the babies. Um, it was more just on all along the outside of the moss, of the nest, excuse me. Uh, so the mosses, also um, can be used as food. So they are not nearly as digestible or nutrient as a lot of other plants are, but in some cases they are sort of the dominant plant in very harsh conditions. And so one example of this is that use animals that use this for food is the pica. So this is a small mammal that lives west of here in high elevations in Colorado and Utah in really kind of harsh conditions. And in the winter, there's been studies to show that uh, in the winter, the mosses can make up uh, a majority of the diet for these guys. 
And there's also a lot of insects that will feed on mosses. And maybe uh, what I think is one of the coolest uh, functions of moss, and this for our benefit mostly, is that they can be used as bioindicators of both water and air quality. So similar to lichens, right? So as I mentioned, moss leaves are highly absorbent. They can take in moisture and other compounds directly from the atmosphere and then incorporate them into their cells. Uh, so one example, there was a study in Oregon and they were, look, they were using mosses to look at cadmium levels, which is a heavy metal. And they were looking at cadmium levels in the atmosphere in a complex urban landscape. And so they were able to use moss to sort of create a map of where the heaviest amounts of cadmium were in the atmosphere. And then going back again to my favorite, those peat moss. Uh, so these mosses are, uh, peat moss is essentially a group of moss in the genus Sphagnum. Peat refers to uh, partially decomposed plant and sometimes animal material. And a lot of the time that's made up of the dead, dead peat moss, okay. Uh, so peat moss can function in water retention. So in certain landscapes, you can have uh, flood mitigation occurring. So in areas where you have large bogs in headwater stream systems, uh, flood mitigation can be really uh, reduced by peat moss. Um, to give you an example of how water retention, like how well they are at retaining water, um, peat moss can absorb approximately 20 times their dry weight in water. And you can compare that to cotton, which we usually think of as a fairly absorbent material. So cotton by, for example, comparison can absorb between five to six times its weight, dry weight in water. So a lot less absorbent in comparison. Now you might have seen bags of peat moss or something like that in the stores, particularly right this time of year, um, because they are commonly used to help condition soil, right? So you're, we are essentially um, adding this organic material to the soil. This can help reduce the soil from being compacted Right, so you think of like clay-like soil, it can be easily compacted and pressed down. If you add this organic material, it helps to uh, lighten, the, lighten the soil and it also helps to regulate moisture in the soil. So it's used a lot in that regard. Um, and probably one of the most important functions that you can find for peat moss is helping uh, to regulate the carbon cycle through carbon sequestration. So as I mentioned, uh, peat is partially decomposed plant material. And in those big peat bogs, you have three components that really reduce decomposition process. Right? They occur in very cold conditions. So that really slows any microbial activity that would break down these plants. They are in waterlogged conditions. Again, a lot of, of these organisms that break down plants require oxygen for their metabolic processes. So having less oxygen available, being underwater also slows the rate of decomposition. And they also acidify their environment. And they do this um, through a process known as cation exchange. So cations, are positively charged uh, atoms. So you can think of things like calcium that can be positively charged that the plant needs. And so it absorbs these ions to incorporate into its system for survival. And in exchange, it releases hydrogen ions. And so hydrogen ions are essentially uh, what makes an environment acidic. 
And this also kind of eliminates a lot of microbes and fungi that cannot live in harsh acidic environments. So those three components really help to reduce the decomposition process and create this big store of dead plant material, which has locked up a lot of nutrients, but also carbon, which is the most essentially most important part of it. So finally, I just want to go over some of the more common moss species that I have found in Arkansas. And some of them I haven't really gone to the species level. It might be just the genus, but um, just recognizing some of the some of the more common mosses in Arkansas. So the first one is the thyme moss. And these are a really pale green really big leaves, so they really stand out. Um, they're sporophytes at this, their little stalks, the seta, are bent right at the top. And so you see that they have this sort of nodding appearance to their capsules. They're sort of looking down. Uh, and that's very distinct for the group of moss. They are acrocarpus, so that means that they have these erect stems going up and not a lot of branching, but they do also have um, sort of these prostate stems as well. So it's sort of like a mix between both of those. So, and so that is another sort of distinction or key feature of this group of moss. And they also have this prominent midrib. So this thickening of cells right here at the center. And for mosses, uh, we call the midrib Another name for it is the costa. So they have a very, it's really, because the cells are so pale, you can really see that midrib very easily. Um, and then the margin of the leaves are usually uh, toothed. So you can see the little teeth if you have a hand lens. Okay, another really common one is the spoon leaved moss. So these guys are going to be a really, again, a really pale green or even sometimes brown in color. Their leaves look really shiny and sort of they get their name from the way that the leaves are shaped. They're sort of concave like a spoon. So they look like they could hold something inside them. And then they have this uh, sort of hair like tip at the top. And they really have like so many leaves that are all around the stem. They're really tightly pressed together. So they kind of give you this idea that they have like a worm-like appearance. They look like little worms. And this is a, one of the pleurocarpus mosses. So there are a lot of branching going on. Okay. Another really common one is the um, so I just give you the genus name here, Atricum. Um, sometimes they're referred to as star mosses, um, but there's also other species that are that are called star mosses. So that can kind of be confusing. Um, but they do have this really distinct, interesting feature. Um, so if you look at under a microscope, the picture of the leaves, you'll see these ribs going down or these little extensions going down the mid rib there. Um, you can see it. Also in the cross section of the leaf, see that these little ridges are just composed of series of cells stacked up on top of each other. And those are called lamella. Okay, so the number of cells that you'll find in the lamella can give you an indication of what species you have. Okay, so these are again, acrocarpus moss. They've got really long leaves and I think my picture's kind of hidden, but they have really long, narrow capsules, kind of look like sausages or something, but they're really tiny. And these guys will get really dried up and crinkly when, when they get dry. Okay, you'll find, you'll find these all over, like moist woods, forests, um, they're really common. 
Uh, the common apple moss is another one that sort of looks similar in that it sort of has these really long leaves. Um, they're a little more narrow. They are usually very pale green. So that is sort of one way you can tell them apart from the star mosses. Um, but the main way is by this capsule, which is a nice big round plump capsule, looks like an apple. And you'll find these, I see these a lot growing on rock outcrops um, and also can be found in soil and moist forests. Here's a moss that actually doesn't mind living in a more dry environment. And so you'll find these in dry, so uh, dry soils in woodlands or on bluffs. And this is the pincushion moss. And it really does have this very cute, tiny little pin cushion look to it with lots of little gametophytes all compressed really close together. And you'll, if you were to look at the leaves, you'd think they'd be a lot thicker than most mosses. And they, they actually do have multiple layers of thickness in their leaves. So here's another cross section of the leaf for the pin cushion moss. It does have this one layer of cells that does have chlorophyll, but then it also has multiple layers of empty cells, and these are called hyaline cells. So they essentially are, they don't produce um, food, they don't photosynthesize, but they do just basically store water. So that helps them retain moisture in that sort of harsher, drier environment that they live in. The fern moss, which I kind of showed you earlier, is that Pleurocarpus moss. This is really common in forests, moist forests, and in more open areas as well. It has this beautiful branching. And if you were to look at it under a microscope, you'd notice that the stem has these tiny little hair-like growths on it. These are known as paraphylia, and it's common uh, in this family of mosses. So if you were to just look at it, maybe with a hand lens or with a naked eye, it just started to look like a really fuzzy looking stem. Um, but it is distinct in the, in the way that it branches a lot and kind of has this fern-like look to it. Okay. The final species that I wanted to, to share with you guys, I think that is really neat, is this rock moss which is a very appropriate name because I'm pretty sure it only grows on rocks. <laughs> um, it actually, this particular species in general is found on acidic rocks. So in, in this area, it would be like sandstone. Um, it has these really long white hair-like projections and the tip of its leaf. And so that really stands out, making it look almost like a grizzled white look to it. Um, but when you see it, it's usually in open, exposed environments, and it's usually really dried up. It looks really dry and crusty uh, and, and really dark, either dark green to almost black in appearance. Um, so that is very distinct uh, and easy to recognize moss when you see it. Okay. And that is all I have for you guys. Uh, again, I want to thank you for your interest and in listening to my talk. And if you have any questions, let me know. Thank you, Karen. I really appreciate that. That was a, a very interesting talk. I really enjoyed it. Uh, we do have a few questions. Okay. <clears throat> Let's see. Um, Rosalie Overby and Deborah Perez were want, both wanted to know, can you recommend a good book for identifying mosses or a website? Oh, yeah, you know, that is a good question. And I am still looking for a good book. And I think that maybe that's my calling is to make one. <laughs> because it's really like, especially for like, the for the area. Um, I have books that are just dichotomous keys that aren't pictures. So no texts. Um, what I like for websites, there is the Ohio Moss and Lichen Society. Okay. 
So if you just type that into a Google search, it should pop up. And because moss are so widely distributed, you'll find a lot of similar species in Ohio that you do find in Arkansas. Um, so I like that website, um, but yeah, there's really, I have not come across a good um, non, not too technical identification book for mosses in this area. What I use <laughs> is this, I have it here, this big old book from the 70s, The Mosses of the Interior Highlands of North America, and there's no pictures, it's just text. It's just um, not, not something I would particularly recommend, but I don't know, do you find, have anything that you, you know of, Eric? Same one, uh, I don't think mine's quite so big, but yeah, like you said, it's mostly a key. And I ordered this from the Missouri Bot Botanical Garden, but uh, yeah, mosses of the interior highlands of North America. So I don't, there might be a little bit of difference between yours and mine. Look like yours is larger. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. um, it looks like Jim Sullivan recommended Jerry Jenkins' book on mosses. Says, he says that one is fantastic. Jerry Jenkins? Uh, yes, I believe that's yes. what he's saying. Not familiar. Yeah. It's like Mosses of the Northern Forest. Okay, I think I have, I've seen that one on Amazon. Okay. It would be on my, my wish list on there. I'll have to check that out. Okay. Let's see, Cheryl asks, are peat bogs over harvested? Oh, yeah. I mean, that that is a, a opinion kind of question. I would say yes. Um, and, and I say that because if you think about it, it takes, hundreds thousands of years for that peat to accumulate and develop and we can rip it out in a matter of of weeks right of a huge peat bog um so you know it's it's you could say it's a renewable resource but it takes like hundreds of years so are they being over harvested i would say yes um but they're not used as much as, as they were in the past um but certainly for just for gardening it kind of makes me sad but i am more of a conservationist so i mean it's a matter of an opinion i suppose yeah it's probably like the same way we consider soil a non-renewable resource because yeah it does renew itself but the time it takes is so long it's much longer than you know, the human time span, or, you know, the, you know, no doubt. longer than our timeline. So, yep. uh, you know, we can erode it all away, you know, and then not be left with another any soil until we're not no longer around. Uh, I did pull this one off my shelf. I haven't really had much of a chance to use it. Uh, and it is for the Northeast, but it's mosses, liverworts, and hornworts, a field guide to common bryophytes of the Northeast. So I'm not sure how much overlap there is. Um, and then also, there's a two volume work, Mosses of Eastern North America. Uh, I got this from Columbia University Press and it's, like I said, two volumes, but it does have uh, illustrated some drawings in here. So yep. just a couple more uh, things to throw out there for people. I, yeah, I, I, that does remind me when I was working in West Virginia, there was this great book, I think it was called The Mosses of the Northeast and Appalachia. Appalachian Mountains, I believe that's the title. And it was good because it had images, it had drawings, and it gave you an idea. It, it told you like, okay, this species is similar to this one, but here's why it's not the same based on like macroscopic features. And that's really what I find is the most useful. What's similar and how do you tell them apart, right? Because you can easily misidentify things if you just look at pictures, basically. Yeah. I think for somebody like me that's really not any sort of specialist in bryophytes, you know, I, I'm always wondering, I have a book that's not really specific to, you know, Arkansas, you know, what am I thinking is what I'm seeing and what is, you know, what is not, you know, so um, yep. it's good to have a regional, uh, you know, field guide that is about the region that we're in. So, so yeah, that's maybe, my calling. Uh, that's what I was going to say. Yeah, we'll be looking for that book here for, for too long. Okay, okay. Um, is Elizabeth Hell asks, uh, what is the best way to transplant pincushion moss? Is it true that buttermilk will help it grow after transplanting? Oh gosh, yeah, I, you know, that is an area I am not 
particularly familiar in is as far as like the growing of mosses. I mean, I think it's awesome that people want to have moss gardens, but I do not know. Um, I don't have any experience with that, so I can't really tell you if, if the buttermilk works or not. Um, all I can say is that if you have like the right conditions where you don't see a lot of plants that are already there that are gonna compete for it, unless you wanna like be weeding constantly, like I would say that's probably the most important aspect of planting mosses. It's like making sure you have the right conditions. And Alyssa Morrison was saying, you know, the moss that grows naturally out of her place, uh, which she calls 100 acre wood out in Madison County, um, she just, make sure to rake around it and keep the leaves off of it during the winter. Yep. Um, and then, you know, rake around where she wants it to spread and it seems to just kind of take hold because the conditions there are already right. Um, yeah, and, that's that's the best way to do it, I think. See, just pin cushion moss, if you pick it up, I believe you can set it back down even upside down and it will re, it will do fine there, right? I haven't had the, the experience, but I'm gonna have to start playing around with that. <laughs> I know back at uh, when I worked at the Ozark Natural Science Center, that's what somebody told me. And I would see some hmm. that had been flipped over, you know, turned over, <laughs> and it looks like it's uh, able to do just fine uh, when you, yeah, it's pretty versatile because it's just kind of sitting there. I just think you make contact with the moisture or the soil. Uh, Amanda Bancroft asked, how do mosses indicate pollution slash water and air quality? And do they change color or not grow in polluted environments? Um, well, yeah, I've, I've read studies where they can, you know, look at the species, like they can do comparison of a stream, for example, that is technically they consider to be polluted versus one that's more pristine, and they can make a comparison of what species occur there, and they can use, so if a species does not occur in a very toxic river or stream, then they know that that's sort of an indicator species if it's not there then that means it's probably not a, a good quality stream. So that's one way they can do it. Um, in the study I mentioned with the cadmium, they actually did like a bioassays where they extracted the chemicals within the plant and did a chemical analysis to see how much of the cadmium there was in the plant versus other plants. And they did a comparison that way. So those are the two ways you can either extract chemicals from the plants that survive in a site, or you can compare what species are present and what aren't and kind of make inference as to how toxic that stream might be, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, it looks like uh, Lewis Ward is asking if this uh, will be placed on YouTube. Yes, it will. Uh, so yeah, be looking for that. Go to our YouTube channel on uh, just type in Arkansas Native Plant Society into YouTube and I'll try to get that up there uh, real soon. Uh, David Darby uh, says it's not a field guide per se but uh, an interesting book is The Magical World of Moss Gardening by Annie Martin. Martin? There we go. Uh, and I've heard, a lot of great, that. heard a lot of great things about uh, the book Gathering Moss, a natural history of or natural and natural and cultural history of mosses. That's by Robin uh, Wall Kimmerer, uh, the same author as uh, Braiding Sweetgrass. So uh, oh. I have not read uh, her, her book on mosses, mm -hmm. but I uh, have heard great things about it. So that would be another preference that people might decide to check out. Um, let's see. Uh, looks like, and, and I apologize if I don't pronounce your name correctly, uh, Ziao uh, says, because of the small size of mosses, one has to use the technical guides to identify mosses. There is simply no getting around that. Here is an online key for mosses. And it included a link. Uh, it looks like it's beta.floraofnorthamerica.org slash mm -hmm. alphabetical underscore list underscore bryophytes. So uh, those of you who want to go to the chat, it uh, looks like uh, they also included another link. Here's a key to different genre, uh, genera of mosses. If you don't recognize moss, mobot.org uh, plants slash plant science slash BFNA slash B1 slash key to mosses underscore two at HTM. Okay, awesome. Yeah. I'm going to be bookmarking those right now. Thank mm -hmm. you for that, Thank you for those references. I have some new books I'm going to be adding to my Amazon wish list too. <laughs> 
This is awesome. This is one thing I love about these webinars, you learn so much, uh, not just from the presenter, but from the other participants as well. Yes, definitely. Yeah, I mean, I just didn't want to, I didn't know how many people would be interested in that really technical. And then there is a lot of like microscope work with some of that stuff. So I don't know how into the weeds you guys want to get. And <laughs> yeah, we get a lot, we get a wide range of skill sets and skill levels. So I just invite oh, okay. to, nice. you know, share anything and yeah. So it's like David also says his understanding of the buttermilk ideas and establishing mosses by grinding sporophytes in a blender with buttermilk and spraying or brushing on matrix surface on onto the surface of in you know, the matrix. So I seem like I've heard of that as well. Uh, you know, with doing it in a blender and then spraying it on there, but I've not tried mm -hmm. that myself. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, are there any other questions before we um, conclude the webinar? Not seeing anything pop up in the chat. If there are, then I'm uh, sure Karen would be willing to um, share those in an email. Uh, I don't know if Karen, if you want me to uh, share your email with folks, but we don't have sure. to. But, yeah, um, that's fine. It's kwillard at uarc.edu, correct? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yep. Right, Feel free so to ask free. me. Yep. <laughs> And Karen also does botanical surveys. So if you're needing uh, to hire a hire contractor who's been really good at plant identification, uh, don't hesitate to reach out to her. Uh, she will probably uh, be able to give you a price, a proposal for what she thinks it would cost. Um, so yeah, she she used to do the surveys out at Woolsey Wet Prairie, I believe. So I and, still do. Yeah, uh, every year. Mm -hmm. And you're doing them for uh, the, the Watershed Conservation Resource Center out there. Dead Horse Mountain Wetland uh, Restoration Site. So yes, yeah, a lot of yeah. high profile sites in this area. So if you've ever wondered uh, who's doing the surveys out there, this is the lady, Karen Willard. Uh, we really do appreciate your time and sharing your expertise with us. This has been really Thanks. fascinating. I want to thank mm -hmm. everyone again for being here with us today. Again, the recording will be placed on YouTube. Uh, so please check out our YouTube channel. If you would like to join the Native Plant Society, you can visit our website at anps.org slash join. Uh, give a quick plug for the next webinar. This is uh, May 12th, which is Wednesday from at 2 o'clock. Uh, Bo Brown, author of Foraging the Ozarks, is going to present on Here Come the Invasivores, Foraging Invasive Species to Help Our Natives. So uh, you can find out more information about the Arkansas Native Plant Society on our website, ANPS.org. Uh, check us out on Facebook at facebook.com slash Arkansas Native Plant Society, or you can reach out to me by email at ANPS.president at gmail.com. Again, thank you, Karen, and thank you everyone Thanks. else for being here today. This is great.